So one of the arguments is that we spend trillions of money, money sorry, each year towards health care. Preventing disease, potentially through synthetic biology, may be a better approach than actually treating it when it starts. Um, in another um, vein, people are arguing that perhaps in the future we will be genetic engi genetically engineering humans to be, say, more resistant to disease, more, um, for example, I guess. So do you feel that it is ethical to say that we can redesign ourselves to better suit society? As in, should we redesign ourselves in efforts to make things cost less? Should we change like who we are? Or should we say that you know what people are like right now, maybe physically, is something that we consider not good enough? I think if we look at that, um, in terms of redesigning ourselves, it would most likely come up a discovery saying, oh, this one gene will decrease the chances of you getting sick. So then everyone else, in the case if we do redesign ourselves, everyone would be the same and there wouldn't be any biological diversity. And you have to think back that one of the ways in which we evolve is through mutations, whether they be detrimental or beneficial. And it's, detriment, it's a detrimental mutation which lead to diseases. But so if we only redesign ourselves uh, according to one single gene or one single trait, we'd all be kind of a homozygous population. And in the case where, say, one random disease or parasite or virus exploits that uh, homogeneity, then we would all basically be wiped out. So I don't think that we should be moving towards redesigning ourselves simply because I, I feel that it would kind of be working counterintuitive to evolution and that we'd be kind of taking steps backwards from where we've already come to where we are right now. Well, additionally, um, it's from, I guess, the basis that you assume genetic modification is something that is accessible to everyone in order to obtain this homogeny. But another argument, as you know, parity are people who cannot afford to be, have children that are genetically designed, are they going to be at a disadvantage because of their beginning social standing? And will this affect their social standing later on because they're lacking these, I guess, improvements? I think that's a really good point in that it brings up yet another way that we could divide society because of kind of the haves and have-nots. And as I agree with what Jamie said, that the idea of modifying humans in order to make them less susceptible to certain diseases, I think at this point we just don't know enough about, about humans and it's too complicated to really start that. We're not at that level yet. I think there's a big difference between modifying a bacteria to get it to produce a malaria drug versus trying to reprogram humans to be less susceptible to malaria. Well, the way that I see um, using these, well, as Jamie was talking about, random mutations that help for evolution, I think that where synthetic biology will eventually take us is basically um, a place where we're able to accelerate this evolution because we are constantly developing ways to um, hopefully, I guess, overcome diseases. But if we can use synthetic biology to design, basically, humans that can, um, in the first place, overcome these diseases, then we're, in a sense, evolving at a faster rate, and I think that synthetic biology can help us in this respect. Turning back to what Jamie had said earlier, um, I think that even if we let um, allow mutations to uh, make people uh, make genetically different, uh, even with after synthetic, they would have been synthetic, um, well, they have, their uh, genes had been um, synthesized. Um, I think that even if um, we allow mutations to happen after that, we we could run into problems that um, we may not have solutions to, and if anything goes wrong, then um, it could like that individual or organism could be um, hazardous to society, and we wouldn't have any way to kind of 
bring it under control. Thank you, Prima. Prima has to head over to class now, okay. so. Okay, she doesn't have to head over to class now, we'll just continue. So, you all brought up some really interesting points, especially, uh, I was really interested in um, what Emily said, how we really haven't come far enough to, you know, go the distance and say, well, yeah, in the future we can do this with humans. So, do you feel that perhaps what do you feel about, I guess, the concerns that are raised about synthetic biology um, when they extend it to humans or they, you know, um, I guess, make predictions about the future? Do you think they're too far-fetched or do you think they're quite reasonable? Um, how do you feel about this? Okay, so what I think is that Yes, right now we're only at the stage of being able to manipulate bacteria, but it's definitely not out of the realm that we will eventually be able to start looking into humans. But the, what the author of the paper brought up was a very important point, was that, yes, there may be risks involved um, in potentially looking at the, how synthetic biology can affect humans and that type of thing, but we can't evaluate those risks unless we go there first. At least that's how I see it as well. Science can't progress unless if we just evaluate risks before we actually go through the scientific process and then understand those risks after. So the analogy brought up in the paper was, for example, building a bridge. Of course there are going to be risks with the bridge after it's built, but you, but you never really understand um, how beneficial a bridge can be until you actually build it and then evaluate it after the fact. So that's just my opinion. I think that's a really interesting point that the paper does break up, bring up. And it essentially outlines the big difference between the two frameworks that we looked at. And I think an important part of the proactionary framework is that although it, it doesn't prevent harm from happening in the same way that the precautionary framework does. It also allows benefits to emerge later that we wouldn't be able to evaluate with the precautionary framework, as we never get to a point where these benefits would be able to emerge. That's a very interesting point, and I think we're going to pause for an intermission before we continue. So we'll see you all very soon. Thank you.